welcome group members. This is Mercedes. Garrett and I are going to give you a brief introduction into Ferdinand de Chauchor's course in general linguistics. This can be a dense topic, but it's very useful and gives us a new way to look at the language we use every day. So we'll jump right in and begin with the question. Okay, so let's take a look at the word hut. Alone, I get an image of some kind of housing for people, but I think of a thatched roof, maybe not actual shingles or anything. I think of it maybe being made of mud or clay of some type. But then we put it into relation to the word shed, and perhaps a shed is a housing of some sort, but I think of it being more of an object housing, maybe storage. And so where these two are related, they also have some differences. Then we bring another word like shack into the equation, and where this takes it back to the idea of housing for humans, uh, we do see some differences where maybe the shack is a more suburban form of the hut, where it's more in the city than in the exotic or something like that. And then in comparison to the house, the hut becomes almost a more unsafe form of housing. The house seems more secure, seems like somewhere that you would want to live, that you would be proud of living in as an American if you want to follow the American dream. And if we want to expand on that idea, you take a idea of luxury into account and you want to live in a mansion, and a mansion implies success and that you have more room than you need and things like that. All of us brings us back to Ferdinand de Saussure. He was a Swiss linguist who wrote A Course in General Linguistics in 1916. Really what he was trying to do was figure out how our language works and what it has the power to do because of how it works. So if you want to break his text down into three major concepts, uh, we're going to look at the arbitrary nature of language, the way that la language works in relation to other language, and how language constitutes our world rather than just labeling it. It doesn't just name our idea, but it constitutes what our world means to us. So if we want to look at our first point, which is the arbitrary nature of language, if we go back to our example of these five words, we can begin to see that the words themselves have no inherent meaning to the concepts that they're trying to conceptualize. So hut absolutely has no relation to the idea of some mud or clay made thatch roofed housing unit. If we had named that kind of concept mansion and that's what everybody socially knew a mansion to be was a thatched little small housing unit, then that word could absolutely be replaced for hut. But all of these words work because they're all different from one another in that the concept that each of these words tries to put the picture of that into your head is all different so therefore each word has to be different so that you can know each idea the word is conceptualizing is therefore different but that takes us to our second point and I know this is all a little bit confusing but it begins to work itself out through examples and through the other two major concepts so I'm gonna let Mercedes take on this second example and we'll keep continue working through this Okay, so the second concept is that language is relational. We can understand a word or sign, as Sashore calls it, is what it is because of what it's not. Sounds confusing, but look at this. So going back to our example of the hut, we know what a hut is exactly because it's not a shed, shack, house, or mansion. That's to say where a word like housing might bring all of these images to mind, the word hut is specific enough to distinguish the idea of hut from the other from these other four or any other forms of housing. The last point that we want to make today is that language has the ability to constitute the meaning of our world around us rather than just label it. And by this we just mean that the meaning we take away from anything that happens within our daily lives is all constituted through language and we apply words and those words evoke more ideas and we grow off of those ideas and we continue this process of language. So really it all comes back to we use words to express ourselves all of that and through that that's how we make meaning of our world so we'll go back to our hut 
example one more time to give you a better look at this. So in my earlier explanations of the other concepts, I started to get into how some of these hold connotations of wealth or maybe poverty or um, the shed holds the connotation of being a storage unit, things like that, that these, or that these words evoke ideas that are completely unrelated to them kind of proves how these words can constitute our reality, that when you say hut, even though all we're really signifying is a thatched roof house or a mud or clay made home, that we also think of the exotic and we think of a, of a tribal community and we don't think of downtown Manhattan and things like that, that all of these things are happening within our heads while we think of just random words like hut or shack or house or mansion, that that's happening is an example of how these words can constitute our lives. So to give you a way better example of these, we're going to look at a pop culture example that most of you will know. So if we look at the ring from the Lord of the Rings trilogy, then we can see all three of these concepts at work within one work. So if you want to look at the arbitrary nature of language, the fact that J.R.R. Tolkien chose a ring to be the symbol of like the destruction or safety of the world, he could have picked any amulet, dagger, anything like that, but it's not so much that the meaning lies in the ring, but the meaning lies in everything that the people in that world place upon the ring. So significance lies elsewhere. Um, relationally, that becomes important because the ring is almost as different from just being a ring as it is from being a bracelet. Like The ring is an entity all itself because it has all these other things attached to it, so therefore the ring becomes a symbol for all these other things that aren't just being a piece of jewelry. And then we see language constituting the reality of the story world, if you want to enter the story world, which you almost have to do for this point, but you see that this one object that has no inherent meaning has the power to end all of the world. And then so in that way, we see characters dying and fighting just to protect one thing that really yeah, they're all dying for a small piece of gold so in that way it constitutes the reality of the story world they go through their entire journey just to save one ring that actually holds no meaning within itself if you want to look at it that way okay so to close we're gonna wrap up these points and general statements because we've known they've been thrown at you pretty fast so one words are arbitrary they have no direct relationship to what they signify and if you look at our second bullet point it sums it up pretty well in the first sentence secondly because words don't hold meaning in themselves they do so through their relation to other words remember a word is what it is because of what it's not lastly through our ability to use words relationally we can make meaning in the world around us and constitute implications for things we say. So for class on Wednesday there's no homework but we'd like you to start thinking about these concepts and applying them to how you speak and think of like how they are active in your everyday language with one another.